Um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Gabby. Uh, I mean, my name is Gabriella, but you can call me Gabby. Uh, I work at Google as a developer advocate, and I'll be talking today about MySQL 8. I go back and forth saying MySQL and MySQL. The correct one's MySQL, but that's just a pet peeve. And I just will probably go back and forth, so please don't mind that. Um, so the MySQL version now, it's 8.0.16. I want to know here who is using or actually gave a look into the version 8 already. OK. Who's running 5.7? Who here 5.6? Who here doesn't know which version they're running? <laughs> OK, a lot of people, if you're using WordPress, for instance, probably running 5.5. They're still not supporting the latest versions. I'm, I'm, I'm confident that at some point they will. I hope so. Because there are a lot of new features that can help a lot of uh, everybody. This version was released about uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and I was just editing my talk toward the new feature, new features that they added again. So they're always adding new stuff to it. Even though it's a minor release, they're always adding new features to it. So a brief history of MySQL, it started actually in 1995, almost uh, in, in May 2000, uh, of 1995, almost 24 years ago. And it was created to handle small scale uh, databases was not thinking on high scalability or high loads of data, and now supports even terabyte sizes of data. So if you ever heard about NDB cluster, you'll probably uh, uh, be able to use that um, high workload with the database. Support secret standard as new as uh, 2016. However, there is some stuff from 2013, 2003 that just became available on on MySQL. It's problematic sometimes because each vendor creates their own implementation of the SQL standard, and now they, are ju they just implemented on, on version 8 the window functions, also known as um, analytical queries, maybe, and CTEs, which are common table expression. So today I'll be focusing on what is new on this version and what you can do with it. So first, first of all, who here has to Google how to create a user on Stack Overflow all the time? Because I, I don't know the command. And sometimes you need to do even to change the MySQL database user stable to change the password if you forgot your root password, which I do often. So with the new user management that's on MySQL, you can create roles, which are reusable permissions. And you can set up password policy, like for instance, you can create a, when it's the user supposed to create a new password, uh, if the password can be reused, uh, an expiration and a rotation of the password. The, the grant statement does not create users anymore because before you just use grant uh, all privileges to a user and it would create a user for you. But now if you do that on 5.7, even the most recent version of 5.7, it's going to give you a warning saying that's, that's changed the syntax. And you don't have to Google anymore that much stuff to know how to, how to create a user, in my opinion. So that's an example. Uh, of you create a role. This one's a role for read-only on the database. And I'm only granting select to the database app. Not, other, not any other database, just the database app. Once I set up this role, I just need to create a user and say, hey, my user is identified by this password here. And I'm going to grant this permission to Gabriella. You can grant permission to uh, se uh, several roles to the same user. It's not only one role per user. But in the, in the role, it also can be used on multiple users. You don't need to. You, it's like reusable code. You, know? you don't have to worry anymore about like, oh, I need to create uh, uh, all that, those privileges. I need to figure out which are uh, for each user if you're doing all the time uh, man user management. On uh, INODP performance, there is a new feature that uh, it's, it's a thing called CATS, which stands for Contention Aware Transaction. Transaction. Um, I forgot what the S is for. But it means it's a new algorithm to deal with uh, high loads. So traditionally, a database, you have um, a queued up system, first in, first out. 
and uh, you start transaction A, and when it finishes, go transaction B, and then when it finishes, goes transaction C. And that's the, the, the start to end, uh, it's always from A to C. With contention aware transaction, as I said, it's the first database in the world to implement it, you have, that's part of my, my, my drawing, uh, it's gonna be online later, so you can have transactions that are different uh, order Get, getting committed first than the other ones. A good example for that is if you, everybody, not everybody, like well, most people know how to, uh, an airport works, right? You go through TSA, uh, in the US you go through TSA or security here in Europe, and then you go to, um, to the gate and the plane, you, you can only board the plane if the gate's on the, uh, the plane's on the gate. However, with cats it's like they know pilots and the crew always have preference on security. That's okay. Uh, the database can, can also do this kind of prioritization. But it's like they know that the, pi the pilot must free the gate so other people can actually use the gate. So it's going to give more priority to the pilot that's going to give it to you as a passenger to the plane. So that's how it works, more or less. There is a blog post about it. I'll, I'll put it together with the slides. So this is an example. So the the um, the higher is better. So you see, you know, when 64 starts to change the amount of uh, transactions per second with the number of clients there are connected. And here it's a latency. It's lower is better. Where the latency for for cats it's even five times lower than the normal one using the FIFO approach. So. That's, that means it's a new, uh, it's faster for you to be using MySQL 8 on high loads than it was before on 5.7. The crates table now supports a lot of new stuff. Uh, people think how much you can improve a crate table, right? So actually you can improve a lot. For instance, uh, the, the non-deterministic -determinist, defaults are now supported, which means you can add functions like uh, built-in functions or, 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 or other built-in functions on the MySQL into the create table. I'm going to show you. So functions, functions and expressions inside the create table are possible. For instance, you have a table orders items, and you have a price, and you have a quantity. You could have say, hey, I have a column total, which the total is price times quantity. And every time you insert a record, it's going to do that calculation for you and insert, insert into the database for you. You don't need to do that. The advantage of having the total on the database, it's because if I multiply that on the side, uh, like on the PHP side, where there's no decimal, where in the database you work with decimals, you may have rounding problems with because of the float. So that's a good, good, good example of how to use that. That means also you can have a better UID support for those using UID, uh, usually on a not recommend the wait. I don't recommend using MySQL for doing document store, but there are, it's possible. It's not recommended with the JSON dat data type. But if you're doing UID, you have a better support now because before MySQL would not generate for you on insert. And remember that I said on create, you can add functions. So you can add the UUID function into the create table. So this is an example. Uh, here, it's, uh, I'm going to show that's the, the UUID being generated, and I convert to binary because I'm saving as binary, which is recommended, <laughs> and not as a Varshar. Well, please don't save your UUID as a Varshar because of performance issues. So use binary. Uh, and I have username, and I just need to insert a username to add it. I have a small demo here. Uh, I actually got a video. because I did not know how the internet was going to work. So here I'm connecting, I'm connected to the database blog and I have my table users. I'm gonna be just creating the table as it is right now to show that the table, it's inserting the users. And once it inserts the users, I'm gonna select from binary to UUID here. And see, 
Here you have the UUID different from, oh, sorry, ah, it's not the thing, it's the video. Here you have the UUID uh, being shown to you. Now you see that I'm now next, I'm gonna be able to create, I'm gonna create a column called expi expires at, where I want my login to expire after a year that I created the user on the database. So they need to change the password. It's some business logic. You can have an expression for that. So and once I put not null, and I can set the default, as I said before, to a non-deterministic non function like current timestamp, which changes all the time that you run, to you add an interval of one year, and once you create, it's gonna show you down next to the created at uh, attribute called expires at. So I'm gonna insert again. And once it's inserted, I'm gonna run the query. So if you look here, you see that I have 2019, 8 of May 2019, and the expires at is 8 of, 8 of May of 2020. So you could do that with any other expression that you have on the database. It does not work with custom functions though, but with built-in functions like for date, UIDs, and that kind of stuff, you can add that to your database. That also changes on new defaults and variables on the MySQL thing, uh, database. So short set, it's how you're gonna store information into the database. And collations, how you're gonna compare that thing that you store into the database. So on 5.7, the default was Latin one, and on version eight, the new default is U2F8, and before, and before it stands for multi-byte string four. And one of the, the new features that this allow, it's to create mathematical equations and save them into the database, for instance, and new emoji, because everybody needs emojis. And if you, the SMP here, supplemental multilingual plane, means people doing those ancient transcripts and want to save into a database, not they can use those characters inside MySQL to save it. It's just mean a better support for, for other languages beyond English. So they're looking more into that. Instead of using Latin 1, you can use now UTF-8 and before. So the collations I said before is how you compare information. You had UTF-8 uh, version 9 support. That's why there is a 0900 in here. And then it's accent insensitive, insensitive, that's why there is the AI, and CI means case insensitive. So which means no matter the case you're writing, or if accent or not, if when it compares, it's gonna compare like coffee, uh, cafe with the accent, with cafe without accent, it's gonna be equal. That's what it means. And no more sushi equal beer bug, which is a weird bug that they had before on 5.7, it's still on, it's on 5.7, where if you use one of the two collations that are here, you have this bug where it says that sushi emoji is equal to the beer emoji. Uh, that could lead to other bugs. That's not just because of this emoji in particular, but like, that means the other characters could have the same comparison being drawn before, even though it was wrong. Other defaults and variables. Lo uh, binary logging is enabled by default now, so which means you, you can rollback changes without, um, you have, you could create a point in time recovery on your system if you're not using a managed database because of binary logging. Uh, SHA-2 for authentication, so if you were using MySQL 8 just like it just launched, you couldn't authenticate in most clients because they change how authentication works. Uh, mandatory default value for timestamp, when I created my table users, I had created table, uh, created at as not no, which means if I try to insert um, a user without that, you would give me an error. Uh, but because I put it the default, you need a default value for not no columns. So that means no more zero time, no more zero dates also on your database. And there is a new variable dedicated to servers, for dedicated servers. Uh, MySQL 8 has the, it assumes that you're already running the database into an SSD drive and not a hard drive. 
and you can configure this flag as on. And once you do that, this flag is going to manage the buffer pool, log file size, and flush method, which is going to change conform, uh, um, as, uh, according to the load that you have on the server and the configuration that you have in there. This is a bleeding edge uh, feature. It just came out now. It, the syntax was supported before, but if you added this before, it would just ignore it. It wouldn't happen anything. So check constraint, it's like, it's like, it's for creating, it's not a, a specific new data type, but allows you to set up constraint into a value to a column on insert or update. So for instance, you can use, uh, use non-generated columns and literals and other constants, uh, built-in functions, but like subqueries are not permitted and not uh, allowed also the custom functions. Uh, environmental variables are not permitted because they are not deterministic, which means they, ch they, are, they change the result all the time, and system variables are not uh, accepted. So this is the syntax for check constraint. I'm saying here that quantity should be higher than zero. And if, if it's not, it's going to throw an error. That means no more data inconsistency on your database, because this check, it's quite cheap, actually, because it's on a row level. You don't, it's not like a foreign key, where you need to look at all the whole table to see on the index to see if there is that ID to be saved or not. But this allows you to guarantee, for instance, that quantity should always be higher than zero, or higher than or equal to one. So this is an example here. I'm inserting here uh, product ID, and you see the quantity here is equal one, and I didn't have any problem saving. But when I put a quantity equals to minus two, it gave me an error saying the checking constraint was violated. So that means, as I said before, no more inconsistency in your database. That's really useful when you have multiple applications uh, connecting to the same database which I don't recommend. I recommend you to have a single API to do with the database. But if you have a legacy application you want to upgrade, that's going to add value to your, to your server. Oh, sorry. So indexes, this feature it's, uh, made me really ha uh, happy because I, if you had to alter a column, uh, create an index on a big table before, you probably had trouble with the time that it took. If it was too much of a uh, size, it was too big, it would take forever because it would copy the whole table with the index to another table and then drop the older table and add the new table with the new name. The sending index is one of the things that they added now. Before, I had a problem when I had a query that would take uh, about a eight, eight to 10 seconds to run because I couldn't do a order by on a descending manner. Only on an ascending manner would, would, would be able to use the index. So on 5.7, if you try to do this, it doesn't work because uh, the syntax allowed the ascending and descending, but the index column name uh, would only be permitted for future implementations of MySQL, and currently they are parsed but ignored. So if you want to use the send indexes, you need to upgrade the version 8. That made me feel really happy, because I didn't have that query that took 8 seconds anymore. So, and it was like making my server go down all the time because the page was taking too long to respond. So that's the syntax. You create the username and on a descending manner, and it actually works now. It does not say to you that it works. Before, it wouldn't give an error, but it actually creates for you the descending indexes. So this is an example of, of the, the, the indexing used. Here, if I do this query, it's going to use the descending indexes because I created as a username as descending index. But if I do the same query in an ascending manner, actually it's going to use the same index. You don't need to worry about creating a new ascending index just because of that. You only just need to create a new index on an ascending manner if you have uh, multiple 
column index, then it, it matters if it is descending or ascending because it can all reverse easily from two columns to one. Uh, but elsewhere, if, if it is just one column on your index, you can create whatever, whatever you use the most. And if you do a query with an, in a different way, it's still going to use it. Invisible indexes is one of the things that allows you to do table ma uh, database maintenance without having to actually drop an index. So a lot of people are doing event sourcing lately, which adds a lot of writing overhead to the database. And indexes are good for reads, but they are bad on writes. Uh, so if you have a table with, uh, with too much indexes, it's going to take forever to write. And as I said before, if you have a big table, it's going to take way more to create. But let's say you have an event table, and you want to see if, if you disable that index, if that's going to change your performance. You don't have to drop the index anymore. You just can say, hey, this index is invisible. So that means, like for instance, I'm going to play with the username here field. And I'm going to say that this username field, it's, it's, um, it's going to be invisible. So indexes, when they are invisible, does not mean they're not updated. They are updated, just not used on, uh, on the query optimizer. They're still used uh, to, to save the data. They're still updated, but on reads, it's not going to be used. So you can change the visibility, and this is an instantaneous uh, alter table. You, it doesn't take, it take milliseconds because it's just a metadata change. So it's going to say if the index is invisible or visible, just that. And you can benchmark the difference on your table to troubleshoot to see if the performance changes or not. So it's a very nice tool to be able to uh, do table maintenance uh, before you actually do the maintenance. Um, that's an example of invisible indexes on action. So you see that the query cost here is 0 0.98, and it, it scanned the index and found one row. And whereas when I put it as invisible, the cost went to over 500,000, and it scanned the whole 5 million rows to the database just by changing the uh, visibility of the index. So as I said before, it's not going to be used for the query optimizer, but it still is updated. I have a demo here. So in this case, I'm changing the visibility of the index to be invisible. I'm showing you that I already have a key there on, on users. And I'm going to do an explain to show you that the, the index is not being used. That's running the, the query and the explain. So you see that type is all, which means it's, it's scanning the whole table. It's not using any key. Uh, and now when I change to visible, I'll do the explain again. And it's going to show a different result on the explain. You see that it's a type range, not all anymore. And you have I, uh, the index being used, it's IX username. And the type is range. There is also a new feature for you that needs to add those columns to the database which means you can have instant add column to your database. You don't need to wait minutes or hours to add a column anymore. There is, uh, you can add a columns without using uh, in place a copy operation. A copy operation would copy, as I said before, the whole data uh, table into another table with the new columns. But there is a few caveats. The new column needs to be appending on the table. You can only add at the end. You cannot have a default on the new column. It can be not no, but it cannot have a default. And you can rename the table. It's going to be instantaneously, as well as modify the column, uh, create virtual columns, and to change the default of a column. So if you add a new, uh, a new I'm going to show you adding here a new column called total to my orders. And uh, you see that it took 0 0.26 seconds. And you can say, oh, that's a small table. It didn't take too long. But no, I have over 50 million records on the same table. 
So you don't need to worry about that anymore, having that long of time and locking your database, uh, locking your tables to read or write. You just need to, as long as you follow the, the constraints, you won't have any problem with that. This is my favorite part. It's actually, uh, it's, super, it's really powerful. They're called window functions. Window functions are there f since 2003, if I recall, co recall co uh, correctly. And they also, also are called analytical queries because it allows you to do analytics on the result. So what they do, it the allows you to analyze rows of a given result set. It can behave as a group by, so it's gonna, you can partition the result uh, in a way that you can change the perspective. It's like, it's like peeking over the window. So it's like when you change the perspective, the result is never gonna change if you use a, Windows func a window function, but you can add new information on top of it and say, hey, what is the most, um, I want the top three orders of this user, uh, and uh, of all users, for instance, and you can do that with a window function. So you can use, for instance, row number to enumerate rows, uh, do an aggregated sum, rank the results, as I said before, and look at neighboring, neighboring rows, which means I can look on the row that's below me or above me, any row that's above or below, but it's not going to change the result. I'm going to show you. So this is an example of the table orders, and if you see here, I just have user ID status created uh, created at and updated at. But what if I want to know when this user, when this first user, when it was the previous order that he had before this one? You probably would do a subquery currently or try to solve this on the PHP script that you have. But now the created at that I, I'm here, I can get this result and say, hey, look at this row that's under me because that's going to be my next order and look at the row that's before me and give me the date of the previous order. So in the end, created at is going to use a lag and lead on this table. So I'm saying, hey, give me the previous row for created at. In a manner, the perspective, it's when it's ordered by the date creation and then the same thing, but for the next order. In the end, I have previous order and next order. So previous order, if you look here, the yellow, actually it's the first order, doesn't have a previous order because it's the first one, but it knows the next order because it is on this row. So you have next order uh, as uh, the date of the order and the previous order before. So you can always look at uh, neighboring results. You could do stuff like, hey, uh, what is the average between orders of this user? You know, and so you can have the previous order minus the, the date of the order you have now. Instead of doing that on the PHP side, which is more, it's gonna take you more time to program and that kind of stuff, you can do on the SQL side, which is gonna be faster because it's on the database, they have the data already. It's just a minus operation, one min minus another. So you have that kind of, access to it. As I said before, uh, window function in this case is lag, and you can say which column you're looking at that you want the result, and how many rows behind you want, in this case is one, by default is one if you omit it, and over which perspective, which window, that's why it's called window function, you're looking at. In this case, I'm looking at order by created at. So, there is a problem here. I hate repetition. I'm lazy. I like doing stuff once and not having and not having to copy code around. So here I actually had to copy the code from created at uh, order by created at. But you can actually name your windows. You can create a window with a name and just reference them on the query and be able to if you change your window here, you don't need to update this part of the query. Here's a simple example, but if you have a big analytical query, this is going to save you a lot of time. I have a demonstration here of that. I'm running orders and I want to see I want to see 
what is the most, uh, the top three orders, uh, I think, of that. So I'm just, uh, not that. Um, I'm showing the, the dates the same by changing previous order uh, created at and next order. And then um, next step, I want to get the top three orders of those users. So I don't want to have to query the database for each user or on a subquery and get the top three. Uh, on a script, you probably would uh, uh, query those three users, get all the orders, and look for the highest order that they have. So I'm using here a common table expression that's going to help me. I'm going to explain next what it is. But I'm selecting ID, user ID, and total from orders. And I'm going to add the rank. I'm going to tell the database, hey, rank the results that you're bringing to me over the user uh, where the total is higher. So partition by user ID, so group by user ID for me, and order by total, and give me the top ones. So when I do that, where order, where user ID is equal to those numbers, and I say where the rank is less or equal than three. That's because I said that the rank was going to be. So if you see here, I'm showing one, two, three, four, five for that user, one, two, three, four, five to the next user, and one, two, three, four, five to the last user. So all the five top five orders for each user are there. If you had like 100 users, you just use the same query. You don't have a 100 queries being fired to the database to know what are the top, top orders for that user. You just have one single query doing the, the work for you. What I show you for you there, the with, the keyword with, it's used on a, what you call common table expressions. So common table expressions are nothing but synthetic sugar for subqueries. Instead of having a subquery inside a subquery, inside another subquery, you can actually use common table expressions to do that. So which means uh, with common table expressions, it's similar to create a temporary table in memory, but you don't have to have the permission to create a temporary table. If you have just select as permission, you don't need to worry about that. It doesn't need to create privilege. Uh, a common table expression can reference another common table expression. On the previous example, I used ranked um, orders. I could have created another, another common table expression use that, using that as a reference. With the result of that table, I want you to do this and then this and uh, chain uh, queries without having to write those big subqueries uh, with the result that you need. It can be also recursive, which means you can do Fibonacci on the database now. <laughs> and it's easier to read. It's way easier to read than that uh, subqueries inside subqueries. So they are the in the case of recursive CT, because I already showed you how a normal uh, CT is, the recipe, it's like any, any um, recursive function works. First, you have the base case. And you have the same thing on the database. You need the base case. The second query in the case of the database is the rest of the cases uh, where you have all the recursion happening. And then you need to have the stopping condition on the recursive call. I'm going to show you. So <laughs> WordPress, for instance, has categories, which has subcategories, which has subcategories. And let's say you want to traverse that tree. It's a tree. Uh, it's a tree. So if you want to traverse that tree onto the SQL side before it was not, ha uh, not possible, because you did not know how to do recursive queries in there, but you would do that on the application side, not on the database. But with common table expressions now on a recursive manner, you can actually traverse this tree. So I have here dog, which it is a uh, child of animal, and tulip, which is child of plant, and the West Highland white terrier, which is child of a, a uh, dog, which is child of an animal. So it's a hierarchical data. So how do I query this? So 
you set up the recursive call with like naming parameters like you do on a function. You set up the depth level, the name of the th the 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 breed uh, of the the item, the category, and the path uh, and the node ID, which is usually it's going to be equal to the parent ID of the previous row. So the first part here, I have my base case, which it is. I'm saying that the depth level starts in one. I cast root as a shore because I cannot have var shore. It's a database limitation here, because uh, if I just use root, it's going to demand that the path always has four characters, which is not true because I'm going to be concatenating stuff. And uh, the node ID is going to start at zero. And then I'll continue here. I'm going to do the concatenation of the of the, the, the path with the name of the category. So categories.name now. And then categories.id. And then I'm going to inner join with categories um, because you can see here the three is actually calling the, the same, same uh, window, uh, not window function, the same query. So here you see the path. And I'm going to change because it's hard to read in here. And I'm going to change, uh, I changed here to be able to read better on like uh, root animal cat, root animal dog, and so on, so on. It's easier to see here. I'm going to also share this with the slides. So again, that's the query. Uh, as I said before, that's the recourse, uh, the, that's the starting case where it is the basic case, and you build upon that. Here you have the three being called recursively. And once you do that, you can do that for any hierarchical data that you want. You can even do a binary search tree in the database if you want to. But I don't say you should do it, but it's possible because you have recursion here. Uh, so that's one example of recursive CTEs. Another th thing that uh, so subqueries are evil, don't do them, <laughs> because they are, they are uh, cause a lot of overhead in the database. And sometimes subqueries is the answer for your, for your problem. And if you must do it, try doing a lateral join. I'm going to show you. Before here, I have this uh, query, which is the same here and in here. I'm just changing which column I'm selecting, if it is ID and if it is total. It's the same query. But I'm running this two queries for each row that I have on my result. I have 10, 10 as limiting factor, so I'm running about 41, um, 21 queries, so it's not effective. There is another way that you can do this, which is called lateral. So lateral, it's a, they call lateral join because it behaves like an inner join on a table that's next to yours. So Instead of having the queries here again to, pick, to get the ID and the total, you can actually select multiple columns on a lateral join and then add them on your select clause. So that behaves like this. So. I just ran here, and that, that is the, the result set on the database, which it is, you're going to see, I have a second, I'm getting the most expensive order for each user. I want to know the order ID and what is the order total. You see here that on the second user, I have no, that because that user doesn't have uh, any order, so it's going to bring us no. And if I continue here, and I'm going to do a lateral join now, to show you the behavior of that changing. So as I said, I had ID and total, and I did a mistake there. Uh, so here it is. You can see the diff. The second user, it's not on the lateral join result. And it brought a new user. And that's because it's like an inner join. If, if the result doesn't happen to be on the two tables, you won't be able to see the result. That's how an inner join works. 
If, it, if it, um, the subquery behaves like a left join in that case, but in this case behaves more like an inner join. That's all I had to talk to you, and thank you. <laughs> Questions?